In Pittsburgh, three firefighters die in the line of duty, bringing new urgency to the search for the cause of a mysterious blaze. Two suspicious fires strike East Baltimore in the same week. Perplexed investigators try to draw a connection To catch an arson suspect, investigators in Reno must rely on evidence from the crime scene. But what kind of clues could survive the 1400 degree inferno? When fire strikes, it's sudden, unexpected, and rampant, consuming almost everything in its path. But through forensics, arson investigators can piece together what's left and raise the truth from the ashes. Some fires start purely by accident. Others only seem that way. It's the investigator's job to tell the difference. In 1995, the urban landscape of East Baltimore was plagued by a series of mysterious fires. In July, Firefighters arrived at 1311 Rose Street to find the row house completely engulfed. No one was living there, but the fire claimed one casualty. A vagrant had taken shelter that night in an upstairs bedroom. The intrusion cost him his life. Rose Street Fire was the second lethal fire in the neighborhood in days. Less than a week earlier, neighbors reported a blast that tore apart a narrow building a few blocks away on Lombard Street. Bricks and debris flew 50 feet from the explosion. A woman who lived next door went into cardiac arrest as a result of the explosion and later died of complications. The Baltimore police and fire departments called in the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms to examine the suspicious fires. Agent James Tanda led the investigation for the ATF. Uh, this was a massive explosion. Uh, these are three-story brick row homes on Lombard Street. Uh, that are contained on both sides. This unit happens to be in the middle of the block, and when it exploded, the entire building collapsed, and the fire was devastating. Uh, if there was anybody else in there other than the arsonists that day, they would have never survived this. Two suspicious fires, two structures reduced to rubble in the span of a few days. The ATF suspected they may have been connected to something bigger, over the past few years, 13 fires in nearby buildings racked up more than $2 million in damage. Now that fires had claimed two lives, the investigation took on new urgency. Fearing they were dealing with a serial arsonist, the ATF and the Baltimore Police Arson Squad sought to determine whether these blazes had been intentionally set and if any connection could be drawn between them. Baltimore arson investigator Mark Profili, a criminalist with the Baltimore Police, was assigned the case. People wonder oftentimes how you can take a bunch of rubble and find evidence, and we believe that uh, Fire doesn't destroy evidence, rather it creates it. So Bob there, Bob, we're gonna need some shots in here. Okay, come on. 
This is where the guy's body was found, so. The victim of the Rose Street fire succumbed to smoke inhalation in an upstairs bedroom. Face down on the floor, head toward the back door, the back window. But the fire had come from below and worked its way to the second floor. The investigative team's objective was to find out exactly where it started. Fire always marks its path. Smoke and burn patterns are the first clue at any scene. As the flames move through a building, they leave distinct patterns, which can lead a trained eye to the point of origin. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Investigators need to know where a fire started before they can determine what caused it. Ready for a new angle? Yeah. Point of origin is that area of the fire, the exact point where the three elements of a fire would come in, in together. That would be um, fuel, heat, and oxygen. And that would be the area from a forensic standpoint that we would look for the physical evidence of a flammable liquid residues being poured. What investigators found when they examined the floor was a circular area that had been burned much deeper than the surrounding wood. The pattern suggested that this was the point of origin. One, I can even say this suggests the person taking the gasoline and pouring it. The wood soaked with a flammable liquid, an accelerant, at this spot. Making her the hard edge burning where the alligatoring effect of the wood stops is a good area to collect samples. It, this sort of defines where the pour would start and finish. Also, the burn through and the tongue and grooves would show us that probably a flammable liquid was poured here. Uh, uh, what makes me believe even stronger that it's a flammable liquid is if you can follow, you see the damage when the floor comes around and goes out, spreads all the way across here, which to me suggests that perhaps our arsonist poured some flammable liquid, small amount here, walked towards the front door, threw the flammable liquid in a large area, sets the can wherever, lights his match, and exits. As the investigation continued at Rose Street, the ATF called in a specialist. Tipper, a dog trained to sniff out traces of accelerant, set to work. She helps investigators identify similarities between arson fires by locating where flammable liquid was poured. With a sense of smell 200 times more sensitive than the human nose, these dogs can pinpoint minute traces of accelerant. Where's that? Find it. See, see here. Seek here. Good girl. Seek here. Seek here. This drastically reduces the time needed to test samples collected randomly. Where's that? Over here. Good girl. Good girl. Seek. When Tipper finds what she's looking for, okay. she sits down and puts her nose onto the most saturated spot. That's good work. Good work. That's good work. Telling investigators precisely what evidence to gather. Samples are then collected for analysis. Okay. Cut that up and fit her in the can. That's perfect. Accelerants ignite with devastating ease, but are reluctant to burn away. If the wood hasn't burned to ash, traces of the vapor will remain locked inside. Pine. This pine right now. Water from the fire hose actually seals it inside the material. In these scenes, we collected the burned wood from the points of origin of the fires. We also collected any burned pieces of wood or clear pieces of wood that uh, Tipper, the canine, hit on. Okay. Sections of wood are carved from the remains, placed into paint cans, and firmly sealed to prevent evaporation. Oddly, Tipper kept 
hitting on a portion of the hallway that didn't appear to have been affected by the fire. Samples from this spot were sent with the other samples to the Baltimore ATF lab. In the lab, evidence cans are pierced and a pipette filled with activated charcoal is inserted. If accelerant is present in the sample, it is absorbed by the charcoal as it vaporizes. The charcoal is then tested for any traces of accelerant. Analysis confirmed that gasoline had fueled the Rose Street fire. Samples collected throughout the house showed that it wasn't just splashed lightly about. The arsonist had probably thought that more gas meant a bigger blaze. But that's not the way fire works. Though the arsonist had accomplished his goal, he was not an expert in the ways of fire. You have to have that fuel-air mixture correct for the fire to burn at its peak as best it could. And they just put too much gasoline in. They didn't have maybe not enough windows open, maybe something, but they just had too much in here. One of the biggest clues was the unburned patch of floor found by Tipper. The ATF found traces of accelerant, but it was faint and far from where the blaze occurred. Show me. Someone had tried to torch this building before. Good girl. Could Tipper's curious finding put investigators on the trail of an arson ring? Center room. Tipped Here, off by their canine the specialist, okay. investigators discovered that 1311 Rose Street had burned before. Two years earlier, the building's owner, Robert Milligan, had received several thousand dollars on a fire insurance claim. Done any money on this? No, not to my knowledge. Baltimore police interviewed Milligan, a businessman who owned and operated a number of low income rental units. Curious as far as how? Well, it doesn't appear to have been normal. Uh, in he told the case, investigators that the fires may have been set by his tenants, who were angry yeah, over recent eviction here. notices. Mm. Quite a coincidence. Mm. Meanwhile, an investigation into the explosion on Lombard Street indicated that it, too, was oversaturated with gasoline. But in this case, the gasoline was spread with a bug sprayer found at the scene. The high concentration of aerosol gas is what caused the explosion. It seemed the arsonist had tried to refine his technique. The Baltimore Police Department's arson squad questioned residents, hoping to locate a suspect. Residents of Rose Street reported that they had been evicted just before the fire broke out. Neighbors near the Lombard Street explosion saw men moving furniture and files from an office in the doomed building, then moving in cheaper desks and cabinets. The more questions the police asked, the more suspicious and similar the fires became. Looking through fire department records, detectives learned that too much gasoline had also been used to start a fire on nearby Bradford Street in June 1995, on Gough Street in April 1995, and on Linwood Avenue in October 1994. Chances are they came all the way over to the 
They were paid 13 over similar arsons had occurred in a two-mile radius in the past two years. Every fire fit the same profile. Too much gasoline poured in the middle of the floor. From the time they did Gough Street, uh, from it was in April of 95, until Bradford Street was just two months. It was April to June. And then from Bradford Street to Rose Street was within days. They actually literally went from June 28th to July 1st to July 4th to July 10th. So in a two-week period, they did five arsons and attempted to do five more. Besides their location and their fate, on the surface, the buildings had little in common. They were owned by different people. Months after the spree of fires ended, investigators hadn't closed in on a suspect. But they felt confident that all 13 arsons had been motivated by the same individuals. Now they had to find them. And what we tried to do was draw a link between this and all of the other scenes, and, and we were able to do that through their lab. We, we were able to find consistencies in how each one was initiated, as well as the accelerant that was used from scene to scene it was all consistent. Yeah, right. If this were an arson for profit scheme, it would take a massive paper chase to uncover it. Police and ATF started with a background check on Robert Milligan, owner of the Rose Street property. They learned he was in deep financial trouble. His businesses and rental properties were failing. His debt exceeded $60,000. Investigators researched every property that Milligan had ever owned. The names of known criminals kept cropping up as his business partners. The next step was to find out if any of these other men had buildings that burned. Using bank statements, corporate records, and fire department, police, and insurance reports, investigators slowly pieced together a string of insurance payoffs that linked Milligan and his business partners to all 13 fires. But who was actually striking the match? The investigation revealed that one of Milligan's business associates was recently imprisoned for robbery. Agents went to the Maryland Correctional Institution to interview him. In exchange for a reduced sentence, he admitted his involvement in the arson for profit scheme. He named another business associate, Paul Beber, as the torch. Beber had been injured in the Lombard Street explosion, he said. The informant told police that Beber had modified his usual pattern, using a bug sprayer to saturate the Lombard Street house. He thought it would be a quick job, but he underestimated its power and was temporarily trapped in the flames. Beber managed to escape and flee with the help of Robert Milligan's brother, Gary. crawled out of the rubble with uh, second and third degree burns and crawled back through the alley to the awaiting getaway car. Uh, at that point, Gary Milligan then picked him up and took him back to his house where they tried to doctor him before he went to the emergency room. As soon as Beber was released from the hospital, he went into hiding. He was eventually flushed out, apprehended, and arrested. To the getaway vehicle. He was surprised, uh, very surprised that he was caught that it was over. He was very surprised. He, he had been running for so long and had led a life of crime since he was uh, 16 years old that uh, at the age of 32 to be apprehended knowing that he was charged now with arson, conspiracy, attempted murder, and a bunch of other crimes, he knew his life was essentially over. To close the case, the ATF had to find a way to link Robert Milligan to the arson scheme. A sting was set up. In this surveillance video, He's discussing the arson with his former business associate, 
who cooperated with authorities under condition of anonymity. Everything's cool, right? Yeah. Well, with me, with me. Yeah. I mean, I mean, can you find out if, with Bundy if anybody knows anything about me, if anybody's listen coming to, me. to see listen, me? Listen, listen right? to me carefully. They told Paul that off, but they know that I'm the mastermind behind it all. It was all the ATF needed. We pay rent. We ain't going nowhere. I don't care. No, no, uh -uh. Police learned that Milligan hired men to evict his tenants a week before the Rose Street blaze. Once he was certain the house was clear, Beber set the fire. Milligan didn't count on a vagrant becoming trapped in the building. Milligan even had police on his payroll to ensure that his people would not be caught. But in the end, his arson for profit ring collapsed. In November of 1996, federal indictments charged Milligan and his five co-conspirators for their roles in one of the largest serial arson for profit cases in Maryland history. By April of 1997, all the defendants had pleaded guilty to arson, conspiracy, and federal firearms violations. The judge doled out stiff sentences, ranging from 17 to 24 years in federal prison. Milligan and his associates tried to cover their tracks, hoping that the power of the fire would destroy any link to them. But forensics had connected the 13 seemingly unrelated fires with the people who masterminded them. Had it not been for good police work and effective lab analysis, their elaborate arson ring might have never been exposed. Other arsonists are less methodical, but catching them can be equally challenging. On November 18, 1992, firefighters from the Reno, Nevada Fire Department were called to a large fire. The blaze tore through the Mental Health Medical Association building. It took firefighters more than 10 hours to conquer the blaze. The fire destroyed the three-story building and the expensive medical equipment inside. The intensity of the fire seemed suspicious. Forensic investigator William Stevenson was called in to photograph and examine the wreckage. This would be one of the first photographs taken at the scene. It's an aerial photograph of the actual building itself. The area just to the west of this porch or towards the residence itself uh, was the area that the fire investigators indicated was the possible point of origin for this fire. Once the fire had been extinguished and the building declared safe, Fire Inspector Bill Burney explored the aftermath. He suspected an accelerant had been used. And I thought it was highly unusual to have so much water on the porch to see flames uh, burning on top of the water. A typical house fire burns around 800 degrees. But judging from the burn patterns and amount of damage, temperatures at the entryway reached 1,400 degrees. Neither an electrical fire nor spontaneous combustion from oily rags would have produced these patterns. They were clearly signs of an accelerant. They included a well-defined pour pattern and severe alligatoring, indications of intense heat in a short time. Bernie and Stevenson looked for something to link the arsonist to the crime scene. 
Despite Stevenson's careful documentation of the fire damage, no compelling clues surfaced. The destructive capabilities of the fire had actually burned up a lot of evidence. And when I left the scene that day, we had virtually no physical evidence to connect a suspect to that scene. That wasn't surprising. The intensity of the blaze made it impossible for firefighters to enter the building. So the order came to flood it from the outside. After a 10 hour dousing with thousands of gallons of pressurized water, most of the accelerant had been washed away. Investigators focused their attention on the front door, the apparent epicenter of the blaze. Near it was a shattered window. Bernie suspected that was where the arsonist poured the accelerant. I determined that the point of entry, the, how the fire was set, is the suspect used a flammable liquid container, probably a two-gallon or five-gallon gasoline, and broke a window and used this motion to pour gasoline through the, this window, therefore possibly cutting the back of their hand or some portion of their hands. If Bernie was correct, then whoever broke the window may have been cut in the process. Could the arsonist have left blood at the scene? It seemed unlikely. Even if he had been badly injured, the evidence would have been washed away or covered with grime. While the investigators scoured the building for clues, their big break came from across town. Investigators Bernie and Stevenson were frustrated by the lack of evidence at the Mental Health Association building in Reno. Fire started way down here low, so that's another indicator. But just as they finished their inspection, they learned about a shooting at a mental health facility in another part of the city. Doctors who had offices in the burned building also worked in this facility. From interviews with personnel, the investigators zeroed in on a suspect in the shooting, James Thomas Manassas, a 57-year-old cab driver who lived five blocks from the fire. His wife, a psychiatric patient, was institutionalized at the facility. He believed that after two years, she was only getting worse. She has been making great strides. I want her to come home. Calm down. She has to come home. Growing frustrated, he directed his anger at the doctors, whom he considered responsible for his wife's decline. I'll take care of her. Calm down, sir. I will take care of you. He demanded that his wife be released, or he threatened to take matters into his own hands. Doctors refused. For nearly two years before the fire, Manassas continued pressuring doctors about his wife's care. According to one of the psychiatrists, Manassas made death threats and promised to burn down the building. On November 18th, just five hours after the arson at the mental health offices, someone had fired two shots through the windows of the mental health facility, wounding two doctors. Whoever fired the shots fled without being seen. From where you were standing, what did you see? Police decided to take a closer look at James Manassas. Officers went to his house and found him bleeding heavily. Both of his hands were severely lacerated. He was brought to police headquarters for questioning. Manassas claimed that he was wounded with a knife during a mugging the previous night. We went out to this location in order to try and verify the fact that he had indeed been attacked here. 
and look for possible physical evidence of that attack. When we arrived at the area, we did a very close examination and we did not find any blood anywhere around this particular location. Look at that. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a nice picture there. Let's get a shot of that. Armed with a search warrant, investigators returned to his house. They found a streak of blood on his car door and several spots of blood inside the vehicle. In the house, they found that Manassas had made no effort to conceal the copious amounts of blood. Oh, we got some blood here. Get a shot of this. In the kitchen, they found blood at the bottom of a bucket. bedroom, they uncovered oh, bloody blood pants and a bloody towel. Oh, yeah. Given his suspicious wounds, weak alibi, and ardent threats against the mental health care facilities, the police felt they had enough cause to arrest him. Bernie and Stevenson believed they had the arsonist in custody but they knew that they didn't have the kind of physical evidence that would assure his conviction. There had been no eyewitnesses to the crime, and no accelerant was found on the suspect's clothing. But his wounds raised suspicions. In reality, Reno PD detectives uh, believe that these lacerations were actually caused by the action of the broken window glass to his fingers at the fire at the point of origin. The only physical evidence to connect him with the scene of the fire would be blood from his wounds, if it survived the inferno. Stevenson was familiar with a laboratory technique in which bloody fingerprints are baked to stabilize them. Was it possible that a viable droplet of blood had been preserved by the intense heat and survived the water and soot? Right by his left foot all the way over to the door. It was a long shot, but at this point, it was all they had. Well, because of all of the hundreds of thousands of gallons of water that had been used on that fire, the actual damage by the heat and flames, damage by the char and the residue and the items falling from the ceiling and such, we were a bit skeptical as to whether we would find some blood evidence at that scene. If there was any blood at the scene, it would have been baked into the concrete. The investigators removed six inches of burned debris. Then they gently washed down the front porch. As layers of wreckage were moved, a series of brown droplets that appeared to be blood became visible. A marker was placed on each drop. The blood droplets led from the shattered glass down the porch steps. Not knowing how much of the blood would yield helpful information, they collected as much of it as they could. Removing the samples wasn't easy. Normally, blood is collected with moistened cotton swabs, but these droplets were much less accessible. The team had to use a scalpel to scrape it from the concrete. The only hope of catching an arsonist was to find his signature in these charred flakes of blood. There it is. The blood samples collected from the burned steps of the mental health building were sent to the Washoe County Sheriff's Office crime lab for analysis. The serology department did a preliminary examination to confirm that the blood was human. The specimens were then sent to criminalist Rene Romero to determine if viable DNA could be extracted from them. We really didn't expect to get results. The stains um, themselves looked like something that came from the bottom of a charcoal grill. And um, high heat is something that can ruin DNA. In fact, the heat had been very destructive. 
But despite temperatures in excess of 1400 degrees, Romero was able to extract DNA from three of the 11 samples. The next step in profiling the blood droplets was RFLP, the most complex DNA test. It's most often used when the sample is in bad condition or is too minute. By exposing the DNA to radiation and using a series of radioactive tags, a DNA profile can be determined. The test took three months to perform. The RFLP process worked on only one of the three DNA samples. The bar pattern it generated was then compared to that of the blood drawn from James Manassas. Was one in 500. Romero's statistics estimated that the frequency of this particular genetic pattern is one in 500,000. The population of Reno is just over 80,000. The slim but powerful DNA evidence had survived the crucible of a devastating fire and bound James Manassas to his hostile act. To Bernie's way of thinking, Manassas was a man who wanted attention for his crime and sympathy for his wife. It seemed like he was a man with an agenda. Basically, I think he was playing with us or myself to, to see how long he could prolong uh, being arrested, and he wanted to be noticed. He was a vigilante. He wanted everybody in the world of the city of Reno to, to think that his wife, who was being treated at the uh, mental health facility, wasn't being treated correctly. For his crime of arson and the shooting attack on the clinic, James Manassas received 76 years in jail. With a gallon of gasoline and a match, Manassas's stunt evolved into an enormously costly crime. Totaling four and a half million dollars. Fortunately, the fire claimed no victims. The ultimate price is paid when fires turn fatal. Shortly after midnight on February 14, 1985, the Pittsburgh Fire Department was dispatched to 8361 Bryceland Street. Captain Thomas Brooks, firefighter Patricia Conroy, and firefighter Mark Kalenda entered the house and made their way down a staircase to the basement. When the stairwell collapsed, they found themselves trapped with no apparent way out. The intense heat and blinding smoke prevented them from finding an exit. Their hose burned in half. Their radios failed. As the fire continued to rage, the oxygen in their tanks ran out. It took several hours to extinguish the blaze and evacuate the fallen firefighters from the incinerated home. Brooks, Conroy, and Colenda could not be revived. None of the Buckner family who rented this house were injured in the fire. Because the fire turned fatal, the Pittsburgh fire inspector contacted the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Special agents Dan Bay and his partner Bill Petratus were assigned to the case. Anytime you have a, a, a situation where three firefighters die or a firefighter dies, it's a very high priority with uh, ATF as far as the investigations go. They requested us in the early part of the uh, investigation, actually right after the fire, to uh, make a determination on the uh, cause of the fire. The agents tried to discover how these firefighters had died. The house, typical of the Pittsburgh area, appeared to be two stories from the front, but was actually four stories built into a hill. This layout contributed to the firefighters' disorientation. 
they failed to notice their passage to safety. They didn't realize that this door could be opened. They thought it was a dead-end closet, so this access was blocked. Their exit route, following the route they used to come in, was blocked because of the collapse. Blinded by smoke, the firefighters felt around the walls, searching for exit windows. When they couldn't find any indentations, they believed they were trapped underground. What they couldn't know, as their air supplies dwindled, was that the room had several windows, but they had been weatherproof and covered with heavy plexiglass. The fire was too hot for other firefighters to come to their rescue, and there was no way to contact them. The three firefighters could not be saved. Investigators now had to determine how the fire started. ATF agents surveyed the wreckage. The majority of it was in the basement and attic. This suggested that the fire began in the basement. Then, having extinguished all combustible materials on that level, leapt up to the attic through the spaces between the walls. The absence of frayed wires or damage to the inside of the washer, dryer, water heater, or furnace dispelled the theory that the fire could have been sparked by an electrical glitch. A pile of charred laundry sat in the middle of the soaked floor. When investigators turned their attention upwards, they noticed an odd burn pattern directly above the burned laundry. The marks aroused the suspicions of investigator Dan Petratus. The joists of the ceiling were burned out in a circular pattern that was probably about 12 feet in diameter. That is unusual. So that was one of our early indicators that something occurred in the basement that wasn't typical of a naturally occurring fire. To understand the fire's progression, the ATF team relied on a series of mathematical formulas. By plugging the values for burning textiles into the formula, Petratus determined that a pile of laundry of that size would generate 176 kilowatts of energy. That figure was then factored into a flame height formula. It calculated that the maximum flame height would be only two and a half feet. The flame wouldn't even reach the ceiling, let alone leave such a large burn pattern. So when we look at a particular fire scene and we interpret the patterns, then the next question we ask ourselves is, does the fuel load that we find in this room have enough energy to create the patterns that we're observing. We need a flame height. Even if the laundry were piled up to the ceiling, it wouldn't create a great enough flame to mushroom out and ignite the joists simultaneously. But factor an accelerant into the equation and the picture changes. The calculator says uh, 1,300 kilowatts. By adding a single gallon of gasoline to the laundry pile, the flame height increases to 13 feet. This model fit the burn pattern on the ceilings and the joists. There was no way that a laundry pile could fuel a fire powerful enough to burn the ceiling unless it had been enhanced with an accelerant. When we plug in a material that has the characteristics and energy of gasoline, then that particular material will create the patterns that we have observed. Petratus had located the origin of the fire and determined that an accelerant had been at work there. But collecting evidence to prove his case would be difficult. Burned shreds of laundry had been soaking in water for hours. The basement floor was made of concrete. 
because it's non-flammable, no, it no, doesn't yield a discernible pour good. pattern. That's enough. Why don't you get that back to the lab? If this case were to be solved, the story would be told in the lab. The ATF lab in Rockville, Maryland was called upon to analyze samples of laundry, wood, and some cement chips from the floor of the house that burned in Pittsburgh. Forensic chemist William Kennard examined the debris from the fire for traces of accelerant. When a fireman sends us some debris uh, and he's looking for an accelerating compound and he petitions us to try to find this accelerating compound from the debris that he sent in. So we use the charcoal strip method. The test involves the insertion of a charcoal coated strip into the canister held in place by a magnet. The can is then heated to about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. If hydrocarbon molecules, the main compound of accelerants, are present, they are captured by the charcoal. The strip is dissolved in carbon disulfide and the resulting solution is injected into a gas chromatograph. The instrument displays a chemical profile of the substance. Kennard then compares the pattern of peaks and valleys to a standard for evaporated gasoline. If the patterns match, gasoline is present on the sample. Kennard found remnants of the accelerant in six of the samples from Bryceland Street. His identification of gasoline in the pile of laundry corroborated the scenario of arson. A fire started when a pile of laundry on the basement floor had been doused with gasoline and ignited. Now, the investigation focused on finding out who did it and why. And uh, your name? Kathy. The ATF first questioned the homeowner but he had nothing to gain by the destruction of his home. The ATF suspected that the Bryceland Street fire might have been gang-related, but that seemed a dead end. They then contacted Ronald and Darlene Buckner, who rented the house. The focus soon turned to the Buckner's daughter, Catherine. When we looked into her background, she had uh, been involved with two other residents in the past year and a half that had basement fires. So she became a very strong suspect. And uh, we uh, considered her for probably six to seven months uh, of investigation before she was eliminated as the, uh, the suspect. As they continued their investigation, the ATF learned that the Buckners aspired to buy a house. In the summer of 1994, Ronald and Darlene had gone to look at homes with several real estate agents. In October of that year, they inquired several times about purchasing houses, but were turned down each time because they couldn't afford a down payment. In November, after five years without coverage, the Buckners took out a renter's insurance policy on the Bryceland Street house. Only three months later, the house was gutted by fire. The insurance company paid $20,000 on their claim. What the company failed to notice was that the day after the fire, the Buckners resumed their house hunting with new enthusiasm. As soon as they received a check from the insurance company, they put a down payment on a new house one that they'd been eyeing since the previous year. A motive was taking shape. Investigators grew increasingly suspicious of Darlene Buckner and her son, Gregory Brown. Darlene said that on the night of the fire, she and Gregory had gone grocery shopping. They returned to find her house engulfed in flames. Yet neighbors had seen Gregory Brown standing outside his home, watching it burn. 
even before emergency crews were on the scene. Another neighbor had seen Darlene driving her car near the grocery store alone that night. Shortly after the fire, Gregory had been arrested on drug charges. He had served 90 days. ATF agents interviewed his cellmates. They told the ATF that Gregory bragged about setting the fire that killed three people and landed his family in a new house. Yeah, actually showing that uh, the, uh, the temperature... The ATF filed the charges against yeah, Gregory no, Brown no, and Darlene you know, Buckner. All the scientific evidence that. pointed to arson. Fire setters unleash a force far beyond their control. By dropping a match in a gasoline-soaked pile of laundry, Gregory Brown set in motion a chain of events that claimed three lives. The jury found Gregory Brown guilty of three counts of second-degree murder, two counts of arson, and insurance fraud. He was sentenced to three consecutive life terms in prison. Darlene Buckner was found guilty of insurance fraud, but was acquitted of the other charges. She was sentenced to three years and probation and fined $5,000. Defying the arsonist's intentions, a history of the crime is forever etched in the scorched and blistered rubble left behind. Through computer modeling, trained dogs, chemical analysis, and astute observation, forensic investigators are able to reconstruct the crime and read the story from its ashes. Investigators race to stop a serial bomber who sends his deadly parcels by mail. Three people have been killed, and no one knows how many more packages are en route to their targets. In California, experts match wits with a terrorist bent on crippling the Internal Revenue Service. For five years, his bombs have confounded authorities. Sheer luck has prevented injuries, but sheer skill is what's needed to catch him. Beneath the rubble, the terrorist leaves a calling card that experts are learning to read. In bomb investigations, forensics means the difference between feeling safe and living in terror. the terrorist's greatest ally. To achieve his ends, he doesn't care who dies. He can strike anywhere, anytime. And though his crimes are carefully plotted, their effect seems horribly random. When bombs are his weapon of choice, he can kill from a distance. In Birmingham, Alabama, two weeks before Christmas, 1989, Helen Vance accepted a package addressed to her husband, Robert. Federal Judge Robert Vance came in from his yard work to find the package on the table where his wife was wrapping gifts. 
Believing it contained magazines he'd been waiting for, he cut the string and opened the box. He was killed instantly. When paramedics arrived on the scene, they tried to help Helen Vance, who was standing nearby when the bomb exploded. She was temporarily deafened from the blast and in shock, unable to speak. Forensic experts rushed to the scene to investigate. They collected nails embedded in the walls and ceiling shards of steel pipe and the remnants of the package itself. The explosion had hurled the shrapnel up to 3,600 miles per hour. Each fragment was carefully catalogued. Only the most meticulous work would allow authorities to catch a killer who struck from a distance. And that killer wasn't stopping. 150 miles away in Atlanta, two days after Judge Vance was killed, a package arrived at the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, addressed to the clerk's office. A routine x-ray revealed the ominous silhouette of a pipe bomb. Before the shocked security officers could stop it, the package dropped to the floor. The officers immediately evacuated the building and called bomb technicians. An alert posted after the death of Judge Vance described the device that killed him. The Atlanta bomb resembled the one in Birmingham. Though Vance's bomb was rigged to explode when the package was opened, the bomb techs had to assume this one could blow at any moment. The drop from the conveyor belt and routine handling in the post office could have rendered it unstable. Their Kevlar suits, three inches thick and weighing 80 pounds, provide safety only at a distance. If the tech is close to the detonation, the pressure from the blast would crush him. The first step was to photograph and x-ray the bomb to study its components. The x-rays revealed no timing device, so the techs breathed a little easier. I think the switch gonna be all right. we know the bomb. There was no reason to rush. Unless a bomb is rigged to a timer or strapped to a victim, bomb removal typically takes hours. Every step was planned, every motion rehearsed. As each maneuver was carefully completed, the bomb techs paused to ventilate their smothering suits and modify their strategy. As a precaution, the area around the building was kept clear of pedestrians and traffic. Throughout the delicate operation, their hands remained uncovered to assure they kept a secure grip. Once they were certain the bomb was stable, they lowered it into a bin and put it in an armored trailer. Police cars and motorcycles cleared a safe area around the vehicle. The convoy took the least populated route to the bomb range at the city landfill. The package was rendered safe, but this second bomb in two days had enormous impact. It suggested a serial bomber. Alcohol, tobacco, and firearms Special Agent Brian Hoback was assigned to the case. 
you got to remember who the targets were. One, a judge, a federal judge. Two, people at the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals who had nothing to do with the judicial system other than administrative matters. But the bomber wasn't through. On December 18th, the same day the Atlanta bomb was deactivated, attorney Robbie Robinson received a package in Savannah, 250 miles away. Like Judge Vance, Robinson had no reason to suspect anything sinister about the package sitting on his desk a week before Christmas. In an instant, he became the killer's second victim. Investigators mapped out the direction of the explosion to better estimate the size of the bomb. They set up a grid and began the tedious task of collecting even the tiniest shreds of evidence. When investigators go to a crime scene, they're looking for physical evidence. Uh, that evidence in a bombing scene is everywhere. It's on the ceilings, it's on the ground, it's in the walls, it's in uh, the furniture, it's, on the it's in the victim's body, it's on the victim's clothing. First we photograph, then we grid the room so that we know exactly where that piece of evidence came from and we can articulate that to a jury. We got down on our hands and knees uh, and collected that evidence, sifted it, uh, stick it over a screen, shake the, uh, the debris to see if we can't find components of whatever the device was that uh, exploded. In that particular case, it was a pipe bomb inside of a cardboard box. One of the more insidious aspects of the bomb was the fact that dozens of nails seen here in x-rays of the victim's body were packed around the pipe increasing the deadliness of the explosion. These nails matched those from Judge Vance's bomb and the package intercepted at the courthouse in Atlanta. The wrapping, found almost intact in Robinson's trash can, was also comparable to the other bombs. With three bombs in two days, time was precious. Agent Hoback and his multi-agency team struggled to find a link between the three targets. Why would someone single out this particular lawyer, judge, and court building? The bombing seemed like random strikes against the legal system. If that were true, the bomber would be hard to predict and harder to catch. They couldn't anticipate who the next victim might be and it was likely that the bomb was already in the mail. His shot is peeled backwards on that. In the lab, experts studied the nails, pieces of pipe, bits of wire, and package remnants collected from the exploded bombs. They took inventory of the most minute details. Barely perceptible markings, fragments of logos, Tiny pieces of packaging all may lead to manufacturers or retail outlets or directly to a killer. But in this case, the items surviving the blast were too generic to tell them anything. The bomber continued with his deadly plan. Fortunately, Jacksonville, Florida NAACP President Willie Dennis was too busy to open her mail on December 18th. Learning of Robinson's death in Savannah and warned by her friends to be wary of any packages, she called her secretary the next day to advise him not to open the parcel on her desk. What she later did was call the sheriff's department down there in Jacksonville and requested them to look at a package that to her seemed somewhat suspicious. The technicians noted it was identical to packages used in the previous bombings.
They photographed and x-rayed it to see if their suspicions were justified. You got power supply, you got wires going into an unknown dense substance. The x-rays disclosed a device that matched the other bombs, so investigators had the advantage of knowing what they were dealing with. The technicians used a mechanical device to disable its firing system. The package had been successfully ripped apart. Still wary of an explosion, technicians carefully pulled the unexploded pipe bomb from the office while maintaining a cautious distance. It was brought to a bomb range, studied, rendered safe, and carefully dismantled. Left behind in the office were the now familiar nails and brown paper with red and white mailing labels. Like most mail bombers, this one affixed more than enough postage to assure his package was delivered. This parcel also contained something surprising, a roll of hate mail. It included a copy of a threatening letter sent to a Jacksonville television station. The postmark linked it to an Atlanta post office. So now, the agents knew the bomb was probably sent from Georgia. The physical evidence was building. These strongly worded letters put right-wing fringe groups high on the list of suspects. The ATF assembled a task force to outsmart the bomber. Terry Pelfrey, a bomb technician with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, was called into the group's monthly lunch meeting. My role in the investigation was to first look at right-wing groups that were located in Georgia. These included the Ku Klux Klan, the Aryan Nation members, Christian Identity Church Movement members, and skinheads. We had informants in each of these groups. Uh, some of the informants ranked as high as Grand Dragons in these groups, which, are, which were the leaders of the Ku Klux Klan. There, were no t there was no talk within the right-wing movement groups that uh, would give us any indication of, of bomb suspects in these groups. Uh, yesterday, you guys At the December 19th meeting, an ATF agent outlined the similarities among the recent bombing incidents. After considerable effort, did you uh, see anything you recognize? He passed around pictures of the bomb recovered at the courthouse and described what he knew of its construction. The device consists of a pipe bomb with flat welded end plates. The description struck a spark of recognition for ATF bomb expert Lloyd Irwin. The bombs resembled one he saw in 1972. Though he had inspected more than 3,000 bombs in his career, he had a feeling this was the work of the same bomber. The minute I looked at it, I saw some characteristics of this bomb that reminded me of the 1972 bomb. That being that it had square end plates held with a bolt through the center. Only had one bolt, but still it was the same technique. How about uh, drawing me a picture? He hadn't seen another like it in more than 15 years. From memory, Irwin sketched the 1972 bomb. You learn that the guy, even though he changes his technique, if he's made them before, he'll usually he'll keep something similar because he knows it worked before. Why trash it when he can make it work again? So he might modify it, but he'll still have some similarities of something that he's done before. Did we get him? Yeah. Uh, yeah For Irwin, the construction of the devices bore the signature of the 1972 bomber. Right after the meeting, he called Special Agent Hoback. So Lloyd Irwin called me back at the office to advise me that he had seen only one other device like this in all the years that he had been involved in these types of investigations. And he gave me the name of the man who had been convicted of possessing that device in 1972. That man's name was Walter Leroy Moody. Roy Moody had been convicted of building a bomb he intended to send to the man who had repossessed his car. The bomb's real victim, however, was Moody's wife, Hazel, who inadvertently opened the package, injuring her hand and eye 
and severely burning her face. Roy Moody went to prison and Hazel was granted a divorce. The ATF began taking a closer look at Roy Moody. We eliminate suspects by uh, different things. Motive might be uh, one way to eliminate them, whether their presence was actually in the area. Uh, there's a number of ways to eliminate suspects. However, what we were doing with other suspects by eliminating them, uh, we could not do with Walter Leroy Moody. At this point, most of the evidence linking Moody to the bombings was circumstantial. The investigators now had to positively link the components of the bombs to the suspected bomber. For that, they relied on the ATF forensics lab in Atlanta. By analyzing the chemical composition of the detonators and primers, experts determined who manufactured them. Fortunately, the company had very limited distribution in the southeast. The manufacturer provided a list of the stores that sold their product. Meanwhile, the ATF noted further similarities between Moody's 1972 bomb and the recent ones. All used cardboard boxes, metal pipes with square end caps and a rod, flashlight batteries, and flashlight bulbs. So investigators would have more first-hand information, specialists recreated and detonated the bombs. When powder packed inside a sealed pipe is ignited, it quickly converts from solid to gas. The resulting pressure is enormous. In an instant, the pipe bursts, sending razor-sharp fragments of steel and nails in all directions at deadly speed. Whoever built these bombs went to great lengths to maximize their destructive power. They were made for only one purpose, to kill. A behavioral profile described the killer as a white male, working and living alone or with one other person, disciplined, educated, self-structured, meticulous, and cowardly. He believed his current job was beneath him. Presented with that profile, Terry Pelfrey recognized the precise description of the man he had been investigating, Roy Moody. Bill Hagmeyer uh, with the FBI did the psychological profiling. Um, he did not know Walter Leroy Moody at all. Uh, he, in, and so I sat during the uh, meetings uh, with Mr. Hagmeyer. He, he read the psychological profile that he had written up, and he wrote Mr. Moody's life story in that profile. Um, it was really rather scary. The weight of the combined evidence was enough to obtain a search warrant. On February 8th, investigators searched Moody's house. They uncovered law books and transcripts of Moody's 1972 bomb trial. As we found in his transcripts during this search warrant, the highlighted areas where we matched forensically the evidence from the explosive site to the evidence that, found, uh, that was found within his home in his workshop, all that matched in 1972. So in 1989, Mr. Moody gets smarter. He thinks he gets smarter. But it was the clues detectives failed to find that raised their suspicions further. We knew that Mr. Moody kept his books from school because he had his law books. However, he didn't have his chemistry books. We also did not find the weapons that uh, uh, apparently Mr. Moody owned. Uh, we knew he owned some because he had ammunition in the front seat of his pickup truck. So where were those weapons? Following a lead, investigators secured permission to search the basement of a house in Shambly, Georgia where Moody rented storage space.
they found a pipe with caps screwed onto each end. The caps had holes drilled through them, and one of the ends had a nut welded atop it, ready for a rod to be threaded through. One of the investigators on the scene was ATF Special Agent David Heitch. All ATF agents are trained in our basic school to identify improvised explosive devices, and the most basic and most commonly used improvised explosive device in this country is a pipe bomb. And so when you see a pipe nipple with end caps affixed, I automatically think that potentially we've got a pipe bomb. Heitch took the pipe to chemist Lloyd Irwin, who suspected Roy Moody's handiwork early in the investigation. Irwin scraped the pipe in search of explosive residue. His analysis yielded only rust. The pipe may have been a prototype, but agents had no way to prove it. They just didn't have enough to make their case. In their search for more evidence in the mail bombings, investigators went to stores that sold the brand of primers used in the bombs. Their hunt led them to the shooting iron gun shop in Griffin, Georgia. An employee remembered selling a four pound keg of red dot smokeless powder and 4,000 handgun primers in December of 1989. The large purchase stuck in his mind. Red dot was the powder used in the December bombs and 3,200 primers were needed to fire them. In a photo lineup, the clerk chose Roy Moody as the customer. Investigators felt they had their man. On July 10, 1990, Roy Moody was arrested and held without bail. Police also brought into custody his wife, Susan, as a possible accomplice. She was permitted a bond. Susan Moody was allowed to plead guilty to a lesser charge of conspiracy in exchange for her complete cooperation. She told investigators how she had been a servant to Roy almost since the day they met in 1981. She said Roy taught her to cover her trail, use disguises, buy materials, and mail packages far from home. She also offered the name of Roy's former cellmate. When investigators searched his house, they found footlockers with Moody's name on them. They contained the missing guns and chemistry books. Agents also found ammunition, a bomb diagram, and an arc welding unit. Susan Moody's testimony was crucial to cracking the case. She pretty much put everything together for us. We had bits and pieces all throughout the investigation of why Moody did this, how he did this, uh, to what extent he did, the, uh, he did the bombings the same uh, way that he did in 1972 as far as their construction. However, Mrs. Moody actually told us how he went about the process and how the process began with the motive. And what was that motive? Roy Moody had a history of frivolous litigation. Most of his cases were thrown out of court. He was desperate to become a lawyer so he could fix what he considered to be a flawed system. But he was denied the bar exam because of his 1972 felony conviction for creating the bomb that injured his first wife. When he failed to have the conviction overturned, Moody swore revenge against the judicial system. He started with Judge Robert Vance, 
who had written an opinion denying his appeal. Moody was caught through dedicated investigative work, detailed forensics, and the sharp memory of bomb investigator Lloyd Irwin. We have a computer system at ATF that matches up bomb components, and it's a very valuable computer system, and we're continuously refining that computer system. It's amazing what it can do. It, you can enter the, the components you have from a device, and it will tell you if there have ever been any similar devices constructed. Well, in this particular case, Lloyd beat the computer. And there's, there's no substitute for experience like Lloyd has. The legal system that Roy Moody felt had failed him did not fail the citizens he terrorized. In June 1991, the jury sentenced him to seven life terms plus 400 years, later changed to the death penalty. Moody's twisted agenda relied on the U.S. mail to deliver his bombs to specific people. But other terrorists are not so particular about who they murder. The Oklahoma City bombing was thought to be a strike against government. In the process of destroying the building, 168 citizens were killed. When a terrorist targets the government, there's no predicting how or when he'll attack. In the early morning hours of February 22, 1990, the West Los Angeles Fire Department answered a routine call to douse a burning truck around the corner from their station. But this was no standard vehicle fire. The truck, parked in front of an office building, contained five 55-gallon barrels and clusters of pipes in its bed all tilted toward the building. The pipes were improvised mortars designed to lob pipe bombs. Some had already launched. To keep the barrels from rupturing, firefighters used gentle pressure to cool them and extinguish the fire. Bomb technicians were called in. Members of the Los Angeles Police Department bomb squad rushed to the scene. As they suited up, firefighters explained what they had found. Bomb squad detective Joe Powell realized that a huge catastrophe was narrowly averted. The fire department described that the drums were uh, cherry red hot because of the fire. And they put the fire out with the uh, water hose that they normally use. The fire department was extremely lucky that the device did not detonate on them when they were putting the fire out. Howe's primary concern was to be sure there were no secondary devices, so he checked the fifth floor where windows had been broken by the homemade mortar rounds. The bombs penetrated the office of the IRS, which occupied the fifth floor, but damage was minimal. Then he and his partner cautiously approached the truck. They needed to determine whether the truck was booby-trapped, since their first priority is to keep people from getting hurt. Once the area was evacuated, we went up and took individual samples out of each, in the, each drum, analyzed them at the scene visually, and then sent them back to the lab for a, for a scientific evaluation to see what the chemical structure was. The contents of the barrels were sent to the lab. Using a gas chromatograph, the samples were broken down into their chemical components. The tests determined that the substance inside the barrels was ANFO, an unstable mixture of ammonium nitrate and fuel oil. The truck contained more than 200 gallons of ANFO. To understand the destructive potential of that much explosive, the LAPD performed a test explosion in the California desert. They filled a pickup truck with a combination of ANFO and TNT to simulate the conditions at the IRS building.
the truck had been obliterated. Wreckage littered the desert floor. Nothing recognizable was left behind. In an urban setting, the damage from such an explosion would have been colossal, says FBI Special Agent Nick Boone. That is almost the equivalent of 1,600 pounds of TNT. This is a high explosive. Uh, that blast would have gone out in, in all directions and done extreme damage for many blocks. The only thing that would have made it more devastating is had this same truck been confined as if in the parking garage, the effect would have been something like Oklahoma City. In fact, the parking garage was the scene of a potential bombing less than two years earlier. In that case, too, disaster was narrowly averted. The IRS building had been the target of bombings before. In September 1988, the basement parking garage was the scene of the first incident. Detective Pow and the bomb squad disarmed a 1971 Toyota at this address. It contained a water heater filled with ANFO. It also had a booby trap under the rear tire. When tripped, the car burst into flames. As the fire department extinguished it, they found pipe bombs in the trunk. Bomb squad technicians determined that gasoline cans and plastic detergent bottles in the back seat were filled with ammonia and bleach. They were designed to fill the garage with poisonous fumes. The bombs were deactivated without incident. The car had been reported stolen from the parking lot of Ford Aerospace, but there the trail grew cold. But not for long. Six months later, a routine line check by the power company uncovered pipe bombs attached to four high voltage power poles behind the same building. The bombs detonated, causing minor damage. The IRS building in West LA wasn't the bomber's only target. The power line bombs resembled one found eight months earlier, about 50 miles away. An electronic detonator and ANFO were attached to the base of a power pole servicing the IRS building in Laguna Niguel, California. It was rendered harmless by the bomb squad. It was clear the bombings were related. These attacks and bombings in other buildings dating back to 1986 led to the formation of a multi-agency task force on terrorism. It found that the circuitry in all the bombs was similar. FBI Special Agent Frank Bakhti was a case agent for the task force. All explosive devices, especially serial, serial bomber explosive devices, um, have a specific signature or type of construction unique to, to the bomb maker. And if you could examine a series of, of unexplained bombings, uh, you can examine the way the bombs are put together and make a, uh, a fairly educated guess as to whether one person might be responsible based upon the way the, the bombs are constructed. Besides the design similarities, all the bombings shared a common target, the Internal Revenue Service. We began investigating in several directions. One was to try and find other similar bombings that were committed in this area and to see who was either convicted of those bombings or suspected. We also went in the direction of states' rights, anti-government, anti-IRS groups, uh, because they would logically be the kind of people that might attack the buildings and go after IRS. A potential lead arrived in the mail. In letters sent to the newspaper and to the IRS building, a group calling itself Up the IRS Incorporated claimed responsibility for the truck bombing, as it had the 1988 car bomb attack. Boone considered the letter authentic, as it contained information about the bomb not made public. The envelopes were addressed by hand, giving investigators a writing sample but they had nothing to compare it against. 
A more immediately helpful clue was a digital watch used as a timing device. Investigators believe the bomber was trying to show off his high-tech skills. But to no avail. The alarm on the watch used to ignite the truck bomb wasn't set properly, so the device didn't detonate as planned. Even so, the circuitry of the bombs provided the first clear lead. Many components were built exclusively for the military and were unavailable on the street. That suggested the bomber had some contact with the high-tech industry. The fact that the car used in the garage bombing in 1988 was stolen from the parking lot at Ford Aerospace gave LAPD detective Bob Nelson an avenue to pursue. We learned later on in the investigation as we went through the components that there were certain identifiable wires and electronic components that were directly attributed to uh, the Ford Aerospace location. However, there was no estimate as to when they were actually utilized. There was no date or any way to tell if it was a, a, an old surplus item or something current. Nelson and Boone were certain the bomber was a past or present employee of Ford Aerospace. But the company employs thousands. The detectives had no way of narrowing the pool. Thanks to the swift action of the West Los Angeles Fire Department, one of the most pivotal clues was preserved. The serial number from the truck used in the 1990 bombing was traced to its last registered owners. Mr. and Mrs. Orozco had sold it for $500 in December of 1989. Okay, is it run? According to Mr. Orozco, the buyer hardly spoke asked few questions, and seemed anxious to leave. He didn't haggle over the price, and he paid cash. The name he signed on the title form was James T. Harmon. Police knew that if they found Harmon, they'd find the bomber. But what did he look like? A police artist brought an identikit to the Orozco's to create a composite sketch. It contains hundreds of overlays of generic facial features. By mixing and matching, the artist slowly fashioned a likeness of the suspect that the witnesses were satisfied with. An initial check with FBI, ATF, and LAPD files came up empty. In the meantime, the bomber struck again. On the morning of March 31, 1991, Mortar fire buffeted the parking lot and roof of the IRS service center in Fresno, California. No one was hurt. The 13 missiles were launched from a vacant lot where investigators collected extension cords, wiring, and crumpled newspaper used as packing. They also picked up a digital watch timing device and aerospace circuitry. Agent Boone knew the same bomber was responsible, and he knew he and Detective Nelson were getting closer to catching him. I took one look at it, saw many of our components, and knew this is our bomber again. This is our serial bomber. But this time he slipped up, and we got the major break of the case. One of those components was a what we call a heat sink. It's simply a piece of metal that disperses heat Boone believed the specialized component was probably made by Ford Aerospace. He needed to learn more about it, but everyone at the plant was a potential suspect. Who could he trust? Discreet inquiries about the component brought him nothing. Frustrated, getting nowhere, he showed it to the assembly engineer, 
taking the chance he wasn't the bomber. He walked down one corridor, turned the corner, walked down another, reached into a bin, and handed me an identical heat sink. I can't tell you what the feeling was like at that point. It was the most exciting part of, of the case ever. And I also began to look around quite concerned that I'm now standing here with the heat sink in my hand, and there's every possibility that the bomber is two tables away, is on the assembly line, is the engineer around the corner. We got out of there about as fast as we could get away from the assembly line and back off the floor. Although identifying numbers had been filed off, the components were ringed with red paint. The engineer explained that meant they were defective and pulled off the line. This considerably narrowed down the possible areas at Ford Aerospace. Only 84 of them were ever manufactured and nine of them only had been pulled off the line as defective. So now we really had four of nine in the entire world. Hello, sir. Thanks for seeing us. Investigators brought the composite sketch to the manager of the engineering lab, the most likely source of the heat sink. The manager didn't recognize the face and didn't know a James Harmon. Who was this man? Detectives knew they were getting close, but the identity of their bomber still eluded them. How soon before he struck again? How soon before he killed someone? As their search for the bomber continued, Agent Boone and Detective Nelson received a call from the lab manager. After thinking about it, he did in fact recognize the face in the police sketch. It bore a resemblance to an engineer in the large-scale inspection lab. It looked like a man named Dean Harvey Hicks. The investigators raced back to Ford Aerospace. At his desk, they found anti-IRS cartoons, and in his employee file were writing samples that matched the handwriting on the envelopes of the letters that claimed responsibility. Once we reached a, uh, a part of the investigation where uh, we were at Ford Aerospace and Nick Boone pulled open the personnel file and made the comparison with the photograph and the hand printing and handwriting, uh, we knew that uh, Dean Harvey Hicks was our suspect. Digging deeper, agents learned that on January 17, 1990, a man named James T. Harmon purchased 700 pounds of ammonium nitrate fertilizer, the main ingredient of ANFO, at the Orange County Farm Supply Company. James T. Harmon was the name on the DMV form submitted after the purchase of the truck used in the 1990 bombing. The handwriting on the receipt matched that of Dean Harvey Hicks. Incriminating handwriting was also found at the scene of the Fresno bombing, placing Hicks at the scene. He had figured on some newspaper how far his mortar bombs would fire, how much powder would send the bomb how far, and he had worked this out on this piece of newspaper. He then wadded that up and actually used it for packing in the Fresno device. We had that also, and we straightened that out and were able to look at the numbers on a flat surface. We were able to actually also match those to his handwriting. Agent Boone and Detective Nelson tallied the evidence. Hicks had been off work when each of the bombs was planted. He had access to all of the items linked to Ford Aerospace. He matched the description of the purchaser of the truck used in 1990, and his handwriting matched the letters claiming responsibility. But detectives didn't know if he was acting alone. Before they arrested him, they kept an eye on him. Surveillance continued while the arrest warrant and search warrants were being prepared while we looked into his past to determine whether or not there was other people involved with him. At uh, a point in the investigation, uh, we believe that there may be some interest in him constructing another device. Uh, we initiated the, the search warrant and the arrest warrant the following day. His arrest came on July 11, 1991. 
Hicks was brought to a hotel room for interview. There, he seemed pleased to provide details about the bombings. He especially liked to answer technical questions the investigators could not figure out. By the time we had finished the interview, uh, Dean Hicks had made a complete confession and described to us in great detail how he put together and delivered most of the bombs. He actually had some loss of recollection on some of them because it was just too long ago, but he was incredibly detailed on all of the more recent bombings, how he meticulously put them together and how he constructed them and how he delivered them to the site. While Boone and Nelson interviewed Hicks, forensics experts searched his house and garage. There, they found bombs in progress, circuits, ammonium nitrate, and false ID bearing the name of James T. Harmon. The story became very clear. His co-workers at Ford Aerospace knew that Dean Harvey Hicks despised the IRS. But they didn't know he was stealing parts from the workplace in order to attack the government agency. In 1981, Hicks had claimed an $8,500 income tax deduction, a contribution to an organization that the IRS did not consider non-profit. It denied the deduction. Hicks claimed that the IRS employee he spoke with laughed at him, so he used his electronics expertise to exact his revenge. Though he claimed to be part of a group, the task force on terrorism determined that Hicks acted alone. Organized groups are not always responsible for acts of domestic terrorism. One person can do just as much damage uh, with a little bit of explosive knowledge as, as an entire uh, terrorist organization. And I think in the past, uh, we would always tend to look at the organized terrorist organizations being responsible for, for some of the acts. Uh, I think Mr. Hicks has shown everyone that, that one person acting alone can be uh, just as deadly and just as dangerous as, as a large group. As clever as Dean Harvey Hicks was, the tireless efforts of investigators like Agent Nick Boone and Detective Bob Nelson finally ended his reign of terror. Finding him guilty on four counts of using destructive devices against a federal facility, a jury sentenced Hicks to 20 years in prison. Ironically, he was also ordered to pay more than $335,000 to the Internal Revenue Service. The crimes of Dean Hicks and Roy Moody were personal vendettas disguised as political statements. Like all acts of terrorism, the senseless deeds of these desperate men accomplished nothing. Despite its mystique, terrorism is a crime like any other. And like all crimes, the perpetrator can't help but leave clues behind. With each new case, Forensic detectives refine their ability to trace those clues back to the criminal. <laughs>